Um, so I just wanted to say that, uh, one second. So I just wanted to say that uh, I noticed that people didn't fill out the week seven discussion. So recall the week seven discussion was so that I can determine, oh, good afternoon, so I can determine office hours for the midterm, but then I realized this week is Canada Day week, so it doesn't really make any sense to have office hours this week. So I'll try to have some office hours early next week because of course the midterm is Thursday. So between Monday to Wednesday, there'll be additional office hours. And the other reason why I couldn't put them in this week is because I broke my ankle over the weekend. So I am in a little bit of pain, so I can't really, I, sitting down is painful. I have to lay down. So I, I can't put any more office hours this week because I just need to give myself time a bit. Thanks guys. Um, so yes, yeah, sitting upright hurts a bit. So I can't put any extra office hours this week. I just feel really painful. It's really painful. There's no um, class this Thursday because it's Canada Day, right? So actually Thursday and Friday are both considered holidays, I believe. Or I, I think Friday's a holiday, right? So that's something I think is true. Um, but so I realized that's a bit of an issue, right? Because some people have tutorials on Thursday and Friday. I'm not even sure if Friday's a holiday. It might actually be, but I know for sure Thursday is one. Um, and because that means people who have, uh, yeah, I don't think Friday is, but I think Thursday actually is a holiday. So people who have um, tutorials on Thursday, they may feel like they can't ask their questions. So I, would, I would urge you guys to attend a different tutorial this week. And then that means that for TA, the TA that is not doing their office hours this Thursday, what I'll have them do is move their office hours to, um, so their office hour will become a midterm next week, midterm office hours. So, for the CA that's on Thursday, there I'm going to have their office hours be a midterm office hours next week because there's no big, there's no tutorial for those who are on Thursday. So that means please attend a different tutorial this week if yours is on Thursday because I don't think that there's class on Thursday. And then that TA will have office hours in addition to two other TAs and myself for the midterm. Now somebody asked what the distinction is between big Z and little Z. I forget with Samara, and I just wanted to point out that big Z is a random variable, right? So big Z is a random variable, it's disputed normal, zero, one. So mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? Little Z is an outcome, is a quartile basically, right? So it's a quartile. So if you ask probability that your random variable Z is less than Z or something, you're, this, is, this is the random variable. This is just the quartile basically. Right, so it's a position, a position on this distribution. So this distribution is a, the whole distribution is a random variable, this distributed normal, but each of these things on the X axis is nothing more than, it's a small Z, small Z is along this, uh, along this X axis, and those are quartiles basically. So when, Z, when little Z is exactly zero, so if little Z is exactly equal to zero, that's the median and the mean. It's literally just, it's, 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 the, it's the median and mean, right? So that you have positions across this thing that are all quartiles and you're asking how much is less than that or how much is bigger than that. So that's what that, that's the distinction between little Z and big Z. Um, so, so, yeah. So this is week eight because week seven was, no worries, week seven was the reading week. So now we are in week eight, which is super weird because there's really technically speaking 13 weeks, I think if you include reading week. So we're already, technically speaking, more than halfway down the course, right? So we're probably about two thirds, which is kind of radical, right? Because I feel like this message has started and we're already going towards <laughs> July. So I, that's a good question. I have not forget when, uh, is likely the case that because I don't want to get too behind, I might make next week's quiz due the end of the week. Because the issue Sumer is bringing up is that obviously it's midterm next week, so people don't like to be studying, competing their interests, right? So I might make the quiz due towards the end of the week, like on a Saturday or something, or a Sunday, rather than on Tuesday, not rather than on Wednesday, so people don't have to think about the quiz before the midterm, right? So because obviously the issue is that people don't want to be studying at the same time that they're writing their quiz, so I might have to... Um, move the day. So I can't get too behind. If I don't test on week eight, then what happens is that you'll never get a quiz before the final exam. So in the last week's content, there's no testing material. And then you, you have gone to the final exam without being able to, to without being assessed on the content that's going to be on the final exam. So what I might do is I might actually end up moving the quiz to the very end of the week. 
so that you don't end up studying. So you don't study for it until you finish your midterm. But if I completely remove it, then what happens is the, the last week's material, you won't actually practice and you, you'll feel uncomfortable with the material before the midterm. So I don't want that, I'm mean, before the final exam. So I don't want that to happen. So I'll probably shift around the quiz, which doesn't happen at the very beginning of the week because that's not very good, obviously, because then you have to study for week eight, which is not in the midterm and people wouldn't necessarily like that. Uh, I probably wouldn't make it available at all because people don't like looking at their, it's not, people don't like looking at their quiz. I think I'll probably only make it available until, like later in the week. So people panic when they really see too many assessments. So I probably won't actually make it available at all till towards the end of the week, just so people don't think about the quiz at all until they finish their midterm. I don't, I don't think it necessarily will help to have the material there beforehand. I think people just don't like seeing it at all. So I probably won't show it until midterm is over. So people don't think, oh my God, if the midterm I have to do this, and it, it, it doesn't really necessarily help people's psychology. So I probably won't show it at all. Um, and so like, I, I probably, but I will probably give people 48 hours. Um, yeah, so I probably give people 48 hours to do the quiz instead of 20, instead of 24, just so people we'll have a bit more reassurance for this quiz. Um, so yeah, but I will probably want to make it available towards the end of the week so people don't panic and whatnot. Yo, know, only one person, should, that's a good question you're asking, Samran. Please only one person submit the initial report. So then make sure you have, make sure you have all of your tutorial, all of your names and the tutorials. Please don't put don't don't each individually submit an initial report because if you're in different tutorials, what will happen is that the TA may give different grades and that's not going to be very good. So only one of you submit, please, right? And then put your your other names, your your other people's names in the tutorial number so the TA can find it and, and add it to their uh, their grade. Yeah, because that way that if if the TA, so the TA knows where to look, so that, so they don't have to so they can go to the tutorial section is really with the person's name. And then instead of looking for the whole, uh, instead of looking through the whole spreadsheet, they'll know exactly which tutorial section to go to to put the person's grade in and put the person's um, grade in. I mean, if you don't put your tutorial number, it's not like, it's not horrible because we could of course find it, but it'd be just make it easier if you if you would put that. So if you can, yeah, please do. <laughs> so the issue with this week is that you see that uh, this is um, re, this re, there's no week twelve, right? Or so there's no there's no Thursday lecture. So I have to probably record this. Um, I will, obviously the issue with recording is that people like to ask questions during class. So I'm going to encourage people to put questions in the chat. So I will open up a week eight chat. So when you do end up watching the lecture, please feel free to put the questions you may have in that chat. Because the thing is, is that obviously, because we don't have classes Thursday, no, I, I'll, I'll get to it eventually. I just, because I broke my, my foot, I haven't been able to get to my emails, but I definitely will get your email today or tomorrow. I'll get your email. I saw it. I, I will, I'm thinking about a solution and, I, and I, I will get back to you. Sorry about that. So yeah, so I will record this. And so if you are, so week eight, um, I have to record it. So if you have questions, please put it in the chat because I do know that you guys are rather interactive. So. Um, I feel bad because obviously I know you guys won't want, want to ask questions and then the issue is that I need to make sure that I'm available to ask questions. So definitely please put it in the chat because it's kind of a, a funny, a funny point in the, yeah, content. So definitely feel free to ask your questions. Um, yeah. So you recall, so I just want to point out that we did say that we were working a lot with discrete variables in part because we cannot do integration, but we did say we would work with a couple of distributions that were actually going to be continuous, like the Z distribution and whatnot, because we have tables for those, the chi square, the T, which means that I'm going to go back to describing categorical versus continuous variables because it's going to, in some sense, determine which distribution we use for things like hypothesis testing, confidence interval construction, et cetera, right? So recall that categorical variables are ones where obviously you don't have a numerical value, right? So they're all discrete, but they differ in quality, not numerical value. So when I say quality, I mean things like strongly agree, agree, which means every variable we were working with in our course survey were actually categorical variables because you can see that None of them had numerical values, although some of them are ordinal if it was like strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, or some of them were nominal, right? When you had like yes versus no. 
So, but they were all categorical variables, right? So now, why am I saying this? Because the type of inference you're making will depend a lot on the variable you're working with. So are you working with categorical variables? Are you working with things that are actually quantitative? Um, when you are working with categorical variables, you can only estimate proportion. So how many said yes versus how many said no? That is um, what we can talk about when we talk about differing in quality, right? So when you say proportion said yes, they, they agree to something. That is you working with categorical variables. Whereas when things are continuous, you can talk about means, right? which we'll talk about in a bit. So for instance, the proportion of smokers in STAB23, now a smoking status is going to be a categorical variable. Either you are a smoker or you're not. You are not. So if we talk about the proportion of smokers, we're going to essentially count out how many said, yes, I smoke, versus those that said, no, no are the non-smokers basically, right? So this is inherently categorical. You see there are only two categories and we can talk about proportion who said, yes, they do smoke, right? So now, let's think about this basically, right? Now, obviously, like I said, if I have this notion of categorical variables, I'm going to, I'm, I'm bound to proportions, right? Because they are all discrete, but they differ in quality, they differ in quality rather than, than numerical value. So we cannot talk about means. You cannot sum up yes versus no into some kind of random mean. In contrast, when you have these, quantitative variables, there are ones that have numerical value. So of course they differ in magnitude because you know that for instance, one is less than two. And we can talk about, because you have this notion of differing in quantity or differing in magnitudes, you, you can talk about differences basically. Now, when you have quantitative variables, because you can talk about differences and things like means and you can add and subtract, uh, we will then obviously estimate a population mean basically. And uh, now of course, you could have variables that are discrete versus continuous. Most of the time, when we deal with quantitative variables in this course, we're probably dealing with the ones that are continuous because they're the ones that we just really can't discretize, right? So things like number of hours you study, but that is very continuous because time is continuous. So of course, in this way, we will talk about mean number of hours. So if, if, at once, if student one studied 10 hours and student two studied 20 hours and et cetera, we can sum up the, number, the average number of hours a student studied in this course by taking the average of all the student hours they studied and dividing it by how many students answer the survey, basically. Where this is something we can do with things that are actually continuous or, or quantitative in general, but we cannot do this with categorical things because they don't differ in magnitude, they differ in set in quality. So differing in magnitude means you can actually talk about like subtraction and addition, whereas when things differ in, um, quality, you cannot do that basically, right? It doesn't make any sense to talk about the, the average of yes versus no. So we cannot talk about means in this in that context, right? So this is, we have to keep these two things in mind because it will actually in, in a very large way determine the type of inference we're making. Are we making inferences about proportions? Are we making inferences about means? We have to first examine the variables we're working with to have this, this, this concept in our mind basically, right? Now there are two types of, um, there are really two types of um, things to consider here. And I do want to say that for the, for the duration, for the most of the course, we were dealing with point estimates. So you, you might say, why am I, I in time I said it, an S, we're making inferences about, making inference about the population parameter. And I kept making it seem as if it was like, like a, a fixed value, and, and many and, and it is like the, the population prime is a fixed value we can't actually quantify. But any statistic we, we we are using to make a guess at um, the population parameter is in some sense a point estimate, right? As in, like when I say a point estimate, I mean it's literally a single point, right? So what what does it mean to be a point estimate? It means that. Um, you are literally taking it, if you have a, for instance, a range of values, let's say on a normal distribution, actually you're making a guess at one particular point. You're making a guess at maybe this point here. You're guessing at mu. So you're guessing this, right? You're literally making a guess at a single point. That is why it's called a point estimate, right? So for instance, the proportion of smokers, there's only one proportion of smokers, there's one value. But at the population level, 
that's going to correspond to how many students in our class actually smoke. Because obviously all you have to do if in theory, if you could get every single student to fill out the survey is to sum up all those who actually smoke and divide it by the whole class. And then you know, that proportion is gonna be those who are of course smokers, right? Now, for some reason, if we cannot get every single student to assess the actual, to, to answer the survey, we're gonna have to take a guess at that proportion basically, right? And that guess is a point estimate because you're only making one guess. You're taking, a, you're taking the, a sample of, of students in the class who don't represent the entire class and you're taking a guess at the proportion of those who smoke. It's a point estimate because you've made a guess at a single number, which corresponds to the true population of students who smoke in the class basically, right? So, when we do this, we have to put theta hat. So this is, so what is this? So notice that this here is, is theta, you know, it's equal, it's, it's theta hat basically. It's, it's, it's been understood as theta hat. This hat is literally actually corresponding to this thing here. It's, it's like it, whenever you have a hat on top, it's saying that it's actually an estimate, right? It's, it's an estimate whenever you have hat on top because you, because you haven't actually, because you've taken a sample of only 10 students, Right, that is not the entire class. So any 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 estimate I get for the actual proportion of smokers is going to be is going to, you're gonna to have to put a hat on top of theta because it's it's nothing more than a guess at your actual true proportion of people who smoke in the class, basically. Right. So what is that? It's going to be the number of smokers divided by number of persons in the class, basically. Right. So the number of persons is of course obviously in this example here, 10, because that's my sample. So I've guessed that the proportion of smokers is 30%, but this is a guess because I've only taken a sample of size 10. This is a point estimate because you've actually made a guess at a, a single number at, at, at what the true portion happens to be. So what is the actual value? So this is, this, is a, this is a guess. This is obviously an estimate, right? This is an estimate, this thing here, whereas theta is, is equal to the true value. Whenever you don't put a hat on top, it's a true value. But the issue is that a lot of the times theta is often unknown in many circumstances. We just don't know what that value happens to be. So we, even though we know that it's a thing that exists at the population level, we can't actually get the true value. We have to guess it basically, right? And now you can see why the representative sample matters because if you have to make a guess like that because you don't know the true value, you had better hope your sample is representative because if your sample is not, any estimate you get for theta hat is not is not true to what the actual true value of theta happens to be, right? So that's why your sample size as well as representativeness matters because if you got an estimate that is really off, it things may not make sense, right? Your actual estimate may not be a good guess, and you, then you don't you don't have confidence in your estimate. Now, in the very first class, people were ahead of the game when they talked about margin of error, which I thought was kind of interesting, right? So. I mean, I've never had a, student, a class that literally anticipates where we're going that early, right? So people were talking about margin of error, you know, several weeks ago. Um, and I said that we get to it eventually after we have more tools in, the, in our bag, basically, right? But what I really wanted to say at the time was that we cannot talk about margin of error, right? Until we, so we cannot talk about it until we, we, can, we can really kind of guess at what a confidence interval happens to be. And we didn't know what a confidence interval was until we talked about the empirical rule, because the empirical rule tells you if you're a certain distance from your actual mean, you can, you, you, if you have things that are bell shaped, you can talk about that basically, right? But what I really wanted to say at the time, but I could not actually say it, is that there are actually two types of estimates we're actually interested in, interested in general when you make an inference. So we're interested in two estimates. The point estimate is one, which is a thing we've been working on the, the whole time. We take talking about like means and proportions since the semester began. We were always focused on the point estimate, but in fact, your point estimate cannot actually happen without also making the interval estimate. We, we cannot talk about the point estimate without, without the interval estimate. You might say, why, like, why do you care about the interval estimate? <laughs> you might say, yeah, so the class, this is actually a really key class to be honest. <laughs> so you might say, why exactly do we care about the interval estimate? Um, it's because the interval estimate in some sense, it implicit to its name tells you uh, the range in which your actual parameter happens to sit, 
right? So you might say, why the heck do we care about, doesn't it, isn't it matter, isn't it only matter that we get a good estimate for the actual point estimate itself? Why do we care about the range of possible values your point estimate could take? And to that, I'd say that if I, as, a, as an instructor of this course, am asked to submit the range of values for my average grade in this course, basically. But like, where does the average grade happen to sit? You know, what, what is the average range of scores for the students in this course? And I said something like this. Well, the average grade can be between zero to 100. But I really give the administrative you know, team much of anything? Not really. Does anyone know why I gave them nothing to say that the average score can be between zero to 100? Like, what's the problem with saying that? I mean, technically speaking, it's true. But there is an inherent issue with giving such an interval estimate. Does anyone know what the problem is with saying, well, the average student score in this course will have a grade between zero to 100? I mean, what information have I given the administration when I said that? Does anyone know? I mean, for instance, how would, how would, this, how would it differ? What if a history, how, how would this, for instance, differ from any other instructor saying the average grade could be between zero to 100? It doesn't really give me much of anything, basically, because of course, the average grade is going to be between zero to 100 since that's the lowest and the highest mark you can get, basically. But I haven't really actually determined how my average grades differ from that of an instructor from a history course or a biology course, et cetera, because everyone is going to have grades between zero to 100 because that's the lowest and the highest the grades can get. I haven't actually given the administrative team anything about where my average mark happens to sit when I say someone can get a 0% or 100% in the course, right? So that's why you actually care as well about the interval estimate because if you give them such, a, such an interval where you can encompass all possible grades. So what I'm saying is that the average grade can be between zero to 100. I essentially said that the average grade in this course can be anything, which is in, in fact giving them nothing basically. To say, that the average grade can, to say the average grade can be anything means actually the administrative team nothing because of course the average grade can be zero to 100, but that doesn't really narrow down where my grades happen to sit in this course. This is exactly why we also care about the interval estimate in addition to the point estimate, because you wanna know in a tight window where your grades happens to sit or where anything you, you're estimating happens to sit and you want this interval to be small based. And you wanna have a very precise interval among which your grades actually sit. Right, so, or, or whatever you want to estimate. Another way I actually kind of, I can actually kind of narrow it down. Exactly, it's, it's basically confidence intervals, to be honest. So the question is, how confident are you that your actual parameter you're estimating sits in a particular range? Well, if your confidence, if you're, if you are basically saying, if your confidence about where your actual parameter happens to sit is you saying that the grades can be between zero to 100, it means you're not pretty, you're not very confident because you've encompassed every single possible grade in the average basic place. When you say that your confidence is that your grades can be between zero to 100, you essentially gave your, your nothing basically because it, what you're saying is that you don't have confidence and in a tight window, which the average happens to sit. And so what you're saying is that the average grade can be between zero to 100, which in fact gives essentially nothing basically. Of course, the average grade can be between zero to 100, but you in fact did not give uh, the, the, the administrative team anything because there is no way a grade can be below zero or above 100 because that's the range of scores any grade can take, basically. So if you don't have confidence to make your, your, your confidence interval very tight, you essentially don't have a, a good point estimate. So your point estimate is only as good as the tightness of your interval estimate base. Your interval estimate has to be very tight around your point estimate to have a very good estimator. If you essentially encompass every possible range of scores in your confidence interval, you essentially don't have a very good estimate because you don't, you don't, you're, what you're saying is you don't really know where your actual value sits basically, right? So another way to think about it is that when you're playing darts, right? And you, and you really wanna, you wanna fine tune where your actual, um, you wanna get to the center of the darts basically. And for instance, let's suppose I got like, you essentially wanna get in the middle of the darts basically, right? If you kind of go around the darts like this, even though, even though sometimes you actually got the center, it's not very good basically, right? Because of course we would agree that somebody who did this, is better. Someone who got all their points in here is in fact better because they kept going directly in the center, basically. It has to be tight to be for it to be accurate, basically. We would agree that somebody who played darts is, is somebody, this person did better than this person because this person was able to narrow down to the center every single time. Whereas this person, even though they were accurate sometimes, they fumbled. 
right? Sometimes they had a very wide, their, their, their range of possible darts was very wide, basically. So they're, even though they're accurate sometimes, because sometimes they landed in here, they're kind of too wide. So their confidence is not as good as this person. This person did better because they're consistently always in the center towards where the actual dart, center of the dart happens to be. So we really want a tight interval. So it's not about, it's not just about being accurate sometimes. You want to be very tight all the time, precisely hitting where the parameter happens to be in a tight window. So, you know, it's, it's if you think about the, the playing darts, just because you got the center sometimes doesn't mean you did a good job, basically, if, if you were, if you're too wide and where you actually hit the dart, basically. Right, so this is why we, we, we think about the interval as well, because we want to always be in the center, like in tightly around the actual point estimate. So we're, we always think about these things as well, right? So this is something to keep in mind that it's not just about, um, yeah, we, well, exactly. When, you're, when your estimates are tight, and you have a very high confidence. That's exactly it. When your estimates are tight, you are, you are feeling more confident, basically. Right, so you want to have a tight estimate. What you feel, you when you feel basically, you're more confident when things are in a tight band, basically. Whereas you don't have a very high confidence if things are very widely spread, basically. Right, so your 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 estimate is not very good. You, sometimes you're accurate, but you're all over the place, basically. You want to have a very tight range in which your actual parameter can sit, basically. Right, so this is why we. It's not just about the. It's just not just about the point estimate itself. It's about how tightly you can put an interval around the point estimate. You want the point estimate to be a, in a tight range of possible bands. You don't want it to spread everywhere, basically, because if it's spread everywhere, you eventually have a very poor, you have a very poor guess where your parameter happens to be, because sometimes your parameter is over here, sometimes it's here, sometimes you get, you get the center, but sometimes you're really off, basically. And you don't want that to be the case in your estimate base. So this is why we, we always want to be tight, tightly in the middle, basically. And, you know, that's how we feel confident when we're really hitting the, hitting the center all the time, basically. Right, so this is why we never, we almost never talk about the point estimate without asking ourselves um, whether or not our estimate is tight, basically, right, around an interval. Right, so you don't want to, you don't want to have a very wide range in which your actual parameter can sit. You, you don't want to say sometimes you are correct, but sometimes you're off, basically, and you're, and you're off all over the place. Right, so this is why we, we always ask our, ourselves about the interval estimate as well to assess basically how 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 tight our, our estimate happens to be. Right, so this is why this is, the game of darts is always a good example to use because like people understand that like even if you you're accurate sometimes you didn't do a very good job unless you're always consistently in the center basically right and it kind of works the same way with statistics even though you may have hit the center sometimes if you're if you're if you're if where your dart happens to go is too wide across the board in fact you didn't really do that well basically right so this is an analogy we can kind of inherently understand right that when if you're competing in a game of darts no one's going to care that you got it in, in center two times if, if you're all over the place across the board too Right, where you at, how many times you actually get the center also matters in terms of points, right? So we're always thinking about like accuracy, precision too, like how precise are you, right? No, we always, we always make the interval, we wanna make the interval as tight as possible. Generally speaking, you want a very tight interval because you want it to be as tight as possible basically, right? So, but there are, thing, there are things that are at interplay, Brianna. So we tend to see if we want the interval to be very tight. We don't want it to be very wide. The tighter you can get your interval, the better, right? So if you get a really tight interval, what you're saying is that, so essentially to understand it, you, you really want to say that like, you, you'd, be, you'd be more confident. So if you had these two distributions here, technically speaking, you're more confident in, in the blue one because you see that even though they have the same mean, your range of possible values in the blue, in blue in, um, interval is much tighter. So, so while they may have the same center, um, the spread is much wider in the red one. So you would actually prefer the blue blue interval because it's telling you that mm, actually your inter, your your parameters really, your your guess at the parameter is super tight, right? So we do, we do care about like the interval in which your actual estimate goes in. You would rather have a very tight interval around the estimate because what you're saying is that here is the very narrow range in which your average happens to sit, and we can have a high confidence that it's sitting in there, which is better than saying. Our possible parameter could be this far to this far, which is too wide. Basically, you, you don't, it's not really that great. If, 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 for instance, these values are very far from each other, say, for instance, you're, you're at like 20 to 80, that's pretty wide, right? So if these are scores, uh, that's not great. So even though, even if the mean for the blue one, so let me, let me, even if the mean, for instance, is like this 20 to 80, and the blue one, the mean, you have like 40 to 50. And let's suppose for the blue one, the mean is like, 42 and 0.1, and even for the red one, the mean is like 42.1. Uh, what you're actually saying in the red one is that your actual intervals between 20 to 80 
with a mean of 42.1. And the second one, you're saying the intervals between 40 to 50 with the mean of 42.1. So we recognize that this is actually better because what you're saying is that the range of possible values around your mean is tight. So while they have the same point estimate, the interval estimate is actually worse here because the range of possible values is too spread out basically. You'd rather say there's a narrow range in which your actual values can take. And even if the means are the same, we recognize that the second one, the blue one has a better point, is a better um, overall estimator because it has a pretty tight mean basically. So these are we definitely, we, we care about these things, right? So we do want it to be pretty tight because this confidence interval represents possible values. Even though, even now your point estimate, Brianna, is 42.1 in this example here, it's possible that your mean could be 42 or it's possible your mean could be 50. This confidence interval re represents a range in which your actual estimator can take. So even though you estimated 42.1, it's possible that your mean is between 40 to 50 in the blue one, and it's between eight, 20 to 80 in the red one, basically. So saying that your mean could be have, your mean could be anywhere between 8 to 20 is pretty bad. But what you're saying is that you have a difference of 60 that you're, where your actual mean could be. That's a pretty wide interval, so it's not a very good estimator. So that's why we care about the tightness, because that, that confidence interval is really assessing where your parameter can sit. I mean, you're saying is your, your parameter can sit in too wide of, in, of values, basically. So we, that's why we care about like the actual um, width of the confidence interval because we want to make sure we're not we're not you know including too much um, in the um, estimate. So yeah, so that's that's why we care about the, the tightness. Even though in, intuitively it seems like you should say, oh, should, shouldn't it be like, don't you want to have more values it could take? Well, no, basically you want to have a very limited values it could take because you want to have a very a very narrow range in which your estimators can take. Because remember, this is a gas. This is a gas at, for a particular sample of size n. Maybe, maybe you take another sample of size n and your estimate changes something different basically, but you don't want to have a wide range of values in which your mean can actually take. That's why you want it to be very narrow. So this is why we don't, it's not great to have a, a wide interval because what you're saying is that um, the value could take is just getting too big basically. So it's not, it's not, there's a wide range of values in which your actual estimate can be. It's not like great. All right, so you can see that's why I actually have here formally theta hat minus the margin of error, theta hat plus the margin of error. Notice that what you're talking about is subtracting a margin of error and adding a margin of error around your point estimate. So you, your, your point estimate is directly in the middle and you have a margin of error that's around it basically. This margin of error, you want it to be very small. Why is that? Because you want to have an, if, if you're, if directly in the middle is your point estimate. So if you have an, if you have a confidence interval that looks something like this, right? So you, what you have is that the margin of error or you have something like, you know, you have a theta hat minus the margin of error, theta hat plus the margin of error. Um, what you really want, right, is you want this the you want this margin of error to be small because you want to you want to very you want the me to be small. Why is that? Because directly in the center of the margin of error is theta, basically, which means that if if the interval is around theta, you don't want the margin of error to get wide, basically. You want the margin. Of, you want the, the. You want it to be like something like this, basically. If, if the if, if this is theta hat and something, you're you're adding and subtracting a certain distance from it. You don't. You want to get if you can get tighter and tighter. So if you can get pretty tight, what you're saying is that you can get arbitrarily close, but your true value of, of your actual theta happens to be the tighter you. If so, this if this red line represents theta hat, your estimate. Um, the the tighter you can, the smaller you can make your margin of error. The closer and closer you get to essentially the theta itself, whatever. So you can see that you want to make it smaller and smaller because this is, if theta is directly in the center, what you're saying is that this is your guess at theta hat, right? So this is the guess at theta hat, right? So this, is your, this is your guess at theta hat. And you want the interval around it to be small because the more you, the more you can make it tight, the more it com compresses around theta hat and the better you get, in, the better your actual point estimate happens to be. The wider your margin of error happens to be, the worse your interval happens to, because what you're saying is that the range of possible values on your margin of error is blowing up basically. So that's not what you want. You, you actually really want to get tighter and tighter and tighter. So when you recognize if you get close, if you're going more up the center, the tighter you get to this, the closer you get to theta hat itself, the better your actual estimate, the more you can make this band around theta hat smaller, the better your actual estimate of theta happens to be. Because remember, theta hat is an estimate for theta. Now, what you're saying is that theta, if the smaller you make theta, so theta, has a smaller range basically in the green basically. So it's a smaller range of possible values basically. 
These are possible values for theta because theta had its estimate. And you can notice that the smaller you range of possible values, the better you are at estimating theta. The, remember, this is always an estimate about theta. Now, of course, you don't want, if what you're saying is if you make the interval bigger, the, the, the possible values for theta is getting too big, which means you don't have a good assessment, but you don't have a good confidence where your theta happens to be. Right? The, the smaller you can make your, S, your interval around theta, the better confidence you have about where your theta happens to sit, basically. So this is why it matters, right? So it matters as to how big your actual interval happens to be, because you want to have a smaller range as to where your, act, your actual value of theta happens to sit, right? I want to have confidence that, for instance, my average grade in this course is going to be between 70 to 76, instead of me saying, oh, it's going to be between 0 to 100. See, so if I say 70 to 76, that's a, that's a six-point difference, which is pretty tight, which is a lot different from saying the average score is going to be between 0 to 100, which is in some sense saying nothing, because of course the average score is going to be between 0 to 100, but that does not give me anything about where the actual average, average happens to sit generally, basically, right? So this is why we care about the interval estimate as well. If you want to know how where the true average happens to sit in this course, of course, I need to make the interval very, very small, right, to get a good assessment. Okay. So as Brianna was saying before, it is actually a criterion to how confident you are basically. No, so it cannot be, theta cannot be negative because theta is a proportion or, well, it depends. It depends, that's a good question, Huda. So in the, in the context of proportions, no, it cannot be negative. So if theta, is, if theta is a proportion, it cannot be negative because it's between zero to one. However, if theta is a mean, yes, it can be negative. If all your, average, if all your data is negative or, or if some of your data is negative, you can have negative means but you don't have negative proportion. So if, if your theta is a, is a mean and it's like ne it's possibly negative, then yeah, you could have negative means, but you would never have negative proportions That is because the lowest can be a zero basically. So it depends on what you're, you think you're, you're actually estimating is. It's possible to have negative values in the context of things that something is continuous and, is a, and you're computing means, yeah. But if you're talking about proportions, then no, it, it can't make sense, right? But you can have a negative confidence interval itself. So by that, I mean, it's possible your confidence, your, while your point estimate for, for, for proportions, for instance, cannot be negative, it's possible your interval has negative values to be continued though. So can theta be negative? Not in the case of proportions, but it can be for means. Now, can your confidence interval have negative values? Yes, and that's a to be continued basically. So as Brianna was saying, it is, it is the case that the margin, your confidence interval gives you a margin of error as to how confident you can be, right? So it, 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 the smaller your actual margin of error is, the more confident you are basically. You, you don't have confidence if your interval is wide because for the picture, the scheme I showed you, we are more confident about our estimate for, for theta here than we are here because you see this is narrower than it is here. So we, we, we cannot say we're confident when our interval is too big basically. So the smaller it happens to be, the more confident we are at, we are basically. Right now, there are factors that will influence how, how we can make this, how we can become more confident, which we'll discuss soon. So we, there are ways to improve our confidence, as in like, make, there are ways to make the margin of error smaller, and we'll discuss this basically. And so now let's see how this can work basically. Okay, so um, let's go back to our example of a portion of smokers. Right now, obviously, we computed our point estimate. Recall that our point estimate was like, so we had a sample of 10 people, so n was 10. And then we said we said that three were smokers basically, right? Oops. So we said n is 10. And then, you know, number of smokers was like three, okay? Equals three. So that means our point estimate is three over 10. Now, what if I give you guys um, of confidence interval. So suppose we know that our, our actual, um, suppose we know the proportion of smokers is between 0 0.02 to 0 0.58. So then the question is, what is is ME, what's the margin of error? So what I'm saying is that the possible range of smokers, so, so first of all, what I'm saying is that I think, I believe the theta, which is a true proportion of smokers is between 0 0.02 and 0 0.50. That's not very good, by the way. When you say that your range of possible, your actual range of possible values that the true proportion of smokers intake 
is anywhere from two, 2% to nearly 60%. Uh, that's a pretty wide margin of error. So this is inherently not very good. But what you're saying is that the true proportion of smokers in this course can be anywhere from 2% to 58%, which is pretty wide, right? So this is why I said that sometimes it's not, it's not about the point that's been allowed. You're not confident when you have such a wide interval base. It's not great, right? So anyways, we can actually find this confidence interval, sorry, this margin of error. You might say, how do we know what this is? Well, I know that at the lower end, so we know that the margin of error is theta hat minus ME, theta hat plus ME. And I know that that's going to be 0 0.3 minus ME, because I know that my true, my, my estimated thing is like 0 0.3 and a 0 0.3 plus ME. So I don't know what this ME is. Whatever that happens to correspond to, this is going to be equal to 0 0.02 to 0 0.58. So this is actually what I have. This is actually the same thing as saying the following. It's the same thing as saying that um, zero, so the same thing as saying the following. 0 0.02 is actually equal to 0 0.3 minus ME. And uh, 0 0.58 is equal to 0 0.3 plus ME. That's what I'm saying. So you might say, how come? Because I know that this, I know that the true, the true interval is this. I've given you this interval here. And I know this is the formula. I know that there's some margin of error that corresponds to this, basically. So what that means is that this is the lower end here. 0 0.3 minus some, minus some margin of error will yield 0 0.02. 0 0.3 plus some margin of error will yield 0 0.58. Now we can solve this because this is, this is a system of equations, basically. You might say, how can we solve this? Well, if I subtract the first and the second, I can probably solve this, right? So this means I'm going to get 0 0.02 minus 0 0.58 is like minus 0 0.56 is equal to, um, well, there's going to be a cancellation of the 0.3. I'm going to get minus 2 me, right? So this is me subtracting. So subtract the first and the second, right? So, you know, I'm going to say 1 minus 2. And then I can just divide by both. So this means that I can just do, you know, so if I want to get rid of minus two, I'll divide by this and I'll divide by minus two. So what I actually end up getting is something like, I think it's 0 0.28 is equal to the margin of error. This is pretty bad. So what I'm saying is that my margin of error is 28%. That's pretty wide, right? So that's not that great, right? So you can see that the margin of error is 28% which is not very good actually, right? So that's actually pretty poor. So that means your actual range of values, 28% is, is very is very wide for the flu. So that's why you have an interval that's pretty wide. You can, in, in fact, make the margin of error smaller by doing something, doing a bit more work because we would probably not want to submit such something where the, you have such a wide range of possible values for the two portion of smokers. In general, the formula actually is one half the upper limit minus the lower limit. So the upper limit is this. So if I go back up here, this is, this here is UL. This thing here is um, LL, the lower limit, upper limit, right? So LL equals lower limit. And UL equals upper limit. Right? Um, so in general, if you want to find the margin of error, if I give you the confidence interval and I ask you to find the margin of error, it actually is going to be equal to this formula here. It's the same thing as what I did it here, but I could, that's the general formula. You can see that I divided it by half. So I, it, it's the same, the, the general formula is actually this basically. Right? Now here's the thing. We know that this is a pretty wide confidence interval. How can we make this smaller? Well, I kept saying, I kept talking about the sample size. It turns out that the size of the sample will determine how, how much you can shrink the margin of error. And in general, it's gonna turn out that we want a bigger sample size. The bigger you make your sample size, the smaller your actual um, margin of error is gonna be, the more we can get arbitrarily close to the actual, to a narrow interval around theta half, which corresponds to where theta happens to sit, right? I will say that in general for this entire course, so far, 
we have been interchanging. So point estimate, when I talk about estimate, which I've been saying since week one, week one we've been interchanging with point estimate, but now we should probably, we should probably have in our mind that when you're estimating a single value, like we were with um, this thing here, that's a point estimate. Whereas this thing here is an interval estimate. The whole thing, this, so we now have two estimates basically. We have the interval and the point estimate and that we have to keep this in mind, right? So and we, 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 now, we now care about both of them basically. It's not enough to just care about the point estimate. We now also care about the interval estimate basically, right? So another example is a, a sample mean. So y bar, so now a sample mean can be negative, just to point that out there. A sample mean y bar is an estimator for the, for the population mean mu. Now, if y bar is the mean number of hours studied per week, now this is, this is actually a point estimate basically. We could of course talk about the interval estimate basically um, around this point estimate y bar, and when you talk about an interval estimate around by y bar, it's going to correspond to where the actual population mean mu, so where mean where mu happens to actually sit is in some range of, of, a, of an interval estimate. Basically, we want this interval estimate to be small. So if I want to know the mean number of hours for typical student studies in STA B23, then I'm going to talk about an interval estimate around the point estimate that, that, so that that, that interval estimate is something we, where we think that the actual mean mu happens to sit. Oh, and that's why we want it to be tight. We don't want to say that the actual mean number of hours of student study is, is pretty wide, basically, because then you, you don't, haven't really fine-tuned where you think it happens to sit in a very tight way. Neat. Now, I will say that in the last, I'm going to talk about this slide in the last probably three minutes, because I think that I'm going to talk about the next slide later on. I'll do that myself, because it's, I don't want to rush things. So this will be the last slide until I record. I have to record this Thursday because there's an air class. Oh, just to remind, I'll, I'll, put in, I'll put an announcement because technically speaking, since Thursday is a holiday, technically our end of week is today. So I'm gonna make a reminder that I will post a lecture and also that people who are in Thursday tutorial, please attend a different tutorial this week because obviously there's no class on Thursday, right? Um, okay, so now what makes a good estimator basically? First of all, an estimator that is unbiased. What does it mean to be unbiased? Um, it means that on average, you actually got an estimator that, that hovers around the true value. So you don't want an estimator that when you, when on average, it's, it's somewhere far from where your value happens to actually sit. That is not a good estimator, right? A good estimator is one in which on average, your actual estimator centers around the true parameter. What does that actually mean? To be continuous. So I'll give you a, a quick prelude. When I say centers around the true parameter, let's suppose my actual distribution, this is my actual distribution. So this is the population distribution. And then my actual sample distribution looks like this. This is a sample distribution. If the actual average, if this is, if mu is actually here, so this is, you know, if this is mu, Oh, it's not very good. I think I could have made this a bit better. I should actually make this like this. Yeah, so if my actual things, if my actual sampling distribution is somewhere here, basically, right? So this is a sample distribution. Then if your actual parameter for the population level is here, you actually also want your sample parameter on average to, to, to be here basically, right? So you, you want an estimator that actually captures where your true population parameter happens to be on average, right? So it should not be that your, your actual sample proportion or your sample mean, whatever it happens to be, is peaking somewhere far from where your actual parameter happens to be at the population level, right? Because then your estimator is not very good. That's what we mean when we say on average, wherever, wherever your actual mode, your distribution happens to be for the sample, it should be at the same, it should be also peaking where the population parameter, parameter happens to be. If, you're, if your sample distribution peaks away from your population distribution, that's not very good basically, right? So that's the first thing. The other thing is that you want your standard error to be very, very small. This is referred, we refer to efficient basically, right? So uh, this one, 
is a to be continued, but we want the standard error to be small. And the reason why is because the margin of error, I'm gonna put it as a here prelude, the margin of error is related to this, is related to standard error. And because your actual confidence intervals is like this, because, you're, because the tightness of your interval is dependent on the margin of error, if you can make your standard error small, your margin of error is going to also be very is also going to be small, which will make the confidence interval small. So the reason why we want the standard error to be small, so we call this efficient, is because your margin of error does is a is related to your standard error, and the smaller your margin of error happens to be, the tighter your your, your confidence interval is. So that's why we so these are the two things you want. One has to be unbiased. We want a small standard error, so the margin of error is also small, and the reason why. The margin of error is related to standard error. I will so what reason why these this is true, I will relay in the recording. But just so you know, if the if the standard error is small, the margin of error will also be small, and that's going to make the interval very tight, right? So why this is true is a couple of slides from now, which I can't elucidate obviously right away, but I will in the recording. So we want two things to be true. We want it to be, you know, unbiased, like I showed in this photo here, where you want the, the sampling distribution to peak around the population parameter, and you want it to be, you want the centered error to be small, basically. Those are the two things we look at. But I'm gonna elucidate these both things more pictorially in the recording. So um, this is not gonna be tested on next Tuesday because the midterm is next Thursday. So I'm gonna make an announcement saying that the quiz will not be next Tuesday. And then I'll also make sure aware of the fact that those will be recording that comes up because this is the official last class of the week. And I'll let people know that if they're in Thursday's tutorial, they should probably relocate to another one this week because there's no um, there's no tutorial on Wednesday or Thursday. But have a great Canada Day. Um, or you know, um, the, the estimate is not always unbiased, Isabel. We just want it to be unbiased. So it's not always so just to create this. It's not always the case that um, it's not always the case that it's not always unbiased, right? So please don't assume that it's, we want it, we want to check that it's unbiased. We cannot always assume it's unbiased, we should check. Thank you so much, guys. So yeah, a tutorial seven, I will open, the, I forgot to open the so submission, I'll open the submission now. Um, you should, we, we can, yeah, so I didn't, I probably didn't open the submission for the worksheet yet. Oh, but I did upload it though. So check now, it's, it's up, Melissa. The, the worksheet's up, you can find an assignment in, in the assignments, but I probably haven't opened the submission for this yet, but I will. But have a great holiday, everyone. Um, and then I'll see you guys next Tuesday, but I'll probably before that, because I'll have office hours um, on Monday, probably. But uh, yeah, so have a great um, holiday, guys. I hope it's very fruitful for you guys.